see at this time is our children are going to go ask uh, ages uh, from three years old up to third grade. So we appreciate those folks working with them downstairs. Now the visual aid is something you're going to be able to identify as soon as you see it. If you've been living in this area, you really will know what it is. And if you read it, there's your hint. You'll know what it is. All right, what is this for our visual aid? It's a newspaper. What is it supposed to convey? News. That's right. It's supposed to tell you what's going on. Now this one is actually an article that was given to me by Miss Rose Decker. And uh, it was very pertinent. And she gave it to me last week. And I told her I'd read it this week, and it is uh, got something to do with the message today. So I'm like, okay, that'd be our visual aid. Clergy burnout. That's what she handed to me. She said, here you go, Pastor. <laughs> I said, I don't really need to read about that. I live it. I know exactly what she's talking about. <laughs> and, and, and in here, here's a quote. Now, this is from uh, Jamie Atten, who is a professor at Wheaton College and the co-founder for Spiritual First Aid. <coughs> I didn't know that existed until I read this article. It says, mental health needs are such overwhelming the faith communities that faith leaders have increasingly stepped up into the role of giving care for the growing mental health di distress. Now, we know that. It, we know exactly what caused it to, to amp up. We, we know that the, the workload for the pastor, while the churches were encouraged not to meet, tripled, sometimes quadrupled. I went from doing a couple hours a, a week of counseling to over 25 hours a week just in counseling. Yes, it was overwhelming during COVID time. Compassion fatigue. See, I know where I've not been familiar with. Compassion fatigue can develop from constant exposure to other people's trauma without taking time to process their own person. Now, folks, I'll tell you that I got a degree in counseling. That's what my doctorate degree is in. And I look at going into counseling to help people because there's such a great need for help, especially with the military. Having come from a retired military background, I thought, hey, I would. No, no, no. Let me tell you what happens when you go to a counselor or when you come to me and I counsel. You unload all of your stuff and then I carry it. Well, that counselor carries it. I realized early in my ministry, I am not doing that. Now I know why they charge a hundred plus dollars an hour. Because it is a burden that you leave feeling better about what's going on. And they leave being burdened down. Why does it lead to burnout? Because the churches have, not you, but churches in general. And you can ask Pastor John this as he's been looking at different churches that are available. They have unreal expectations for their pastor. A pastor comes on with a salary and they don't work 40 hours a week. If you only going to work 40 hours a week, you're in the wrong ministry, you're in the wrong area because you're going to work 70, 80, 90 hours a week and then you hear people complain about what you ain't doing. The pastor is one of the most ungrateful positions you can ever take. That's why I tell folks that when they come to me and they say, I think God's calling me into ministry. Well, let's talk about that. Because you've got to have some thick skin. You've got to be willing to give it your all and not have someone come and pat you on the back and tell you you did a good job. Now, they may tell you after you preach a message, oh, that was a good message. That's okay. It's not the preaching part. It's all the other stuff that goes with it. It's a burden to carry 1,700, that's almost 2,000 ministers leave the ministry every single month. It is one of the higher job ministry is that has a high suicide rate. Dentists and doctors and pastors have the high of highest suicide rate. Because see, a lot of times we identify who we are. You identify who you are based on what you do. You know, I work with the police department. They're a police officer. When they retire, man, things become challenging. What am I? Because I've been a police officer for 27 years. It's all I know. Firefighters, the same thing. Lack purpose and direction when we retire. Pastors are the same thing. It, 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 it's more than just what we do. It's who we are. Now, you're going to find out some things about pastoring today that you probably never knew and maybe not ever wanted to know. But that's okay. You're here. You're going to tune in. You're going to find out a lot. Now, if you've been with us, what book of the Bible are we on Sundays? We're in the book of 1 Timothy. Who's the author of the book of 1 Timothy? God is the author. What earthly man did he choose to write through? He's writing through Paul. That's right. 
And is Paul in jail still? No, he's been released. And when he was released from jail, Timothy met him. Timothy went with him. They went to Ephesus. And then Paul was going on to Macedonia. And what did Timothy want to do? Timothy wanted to go with him to Macedonia. He didn't want to stay in Ephesus. But remember, Paul had left Timothy in Ephesus to be the pastor of the church in Ephesus for a long period of time. And then he was elevated to this position of being an overseer over all of the churches that were in the Ephesus area. He was the representative of God to the people. He represented the people to the Jerusalem church. He also represented the Jerusalem council to the local belief body of believers. He had a monumental task. He was pastoring pastors who are pastoring people. And in addition to his own church, that he was a pastor. So if you've been with us, you know that the whole entire book of 1 Timothy is all about conduct in the church. And it is Paul, it, it, he's one of my favorite writers because, see, he doesn't sugarcoat much of anything. He tells you like it is. I believe he hears it directly from God, and God doesn't sugarcoat a lot of stuff, neither. He's like, uh-uh, you need to hear this, you need to understand it. Hurt your feelings? Oh, I'm so sorry. Grow up! God expects, Paul expects, I expect church folks to mature in Christ. We expect maturity. Now, chapter 1 was all about the message of the church. The message of the church has not changed. It is still the same today as it always has been. Christ left the glory of heaven, came to earth, died on the cross, rose again. And you can have everlasting life if you place your faith in him. You can be born again. You can follow after him. You can be all that he wants you to be. If you choose to follow him. Then when we got to chapter 2, chapter 2 was about the members of the church. Talk about you. Um, then we got to chapter 3, it was about the managers of the church. That's the pastors. That's the ones that are on staff. That's Pastor John, myself. That's Miss Jackie. That's, that's us who are leading the church in the capacity of being up front. Then you have the ministers of the church. That would be the, the Sunday school teachers, the deacon servants, the elders. It's the, the leaders behind the scenes that are making things happen. And then we get to chapter 5, and it's about the ministry of the church. Last week we saw, or two weeks ago, we saw it to the men, then we saw it to the women, and then we saw it to the widows. Last week we finished up by seeing the ministry of the church to the widows. Not by accident that God took quite a bit of time to tell the church the responsibility to widows. And then today we get the ministry of the church, Roman numeral or letter D, is going to be to the elders. Now that word elders in the Greek is the same we get from pastors, bishops, spiritual leaders of the church. So you're going to find out a lot. So you're going to be sitting in the pew or listening at home, or whatever you're doing, or however you're getting this message this morning, and you're going to be comparing the Scripture to me because I'm your pastor. And as pastors, leaders, we're going to be comparing ourselves to the Word and to you. So do we live up to your expectations of what a pastor is? Do you live up to our expectations of what a congregation is? Now, we've already seen in the book of 1 Timothy, God's already spoke through Paul about the calling of a pastor. I oftentimes sit down with people who say they feel God's calling them into ministry. Well, let's, let's work this out. Let's pray this through. Let's check into this. Because, see, there's a lot of people that I think are in the pastorate that were not called of God. Somebody in their mind said, hey, that'd be a good occupation. I think I'd like that. Work one hour a week. I, I, I can handle that. I would enjoy that. And then they find out that you work a whole lot more than one hour a week. And it's not about the public speaking part. It's about everything else that goes on behind the scene that nobody knows about. And they're like, whoa, this is overwhelming me. So they leave the ministry. Some of those are very good communicators. But the question I always have is, are they first called of God? I could not imagine doing this not called of God. I wouldn't be doing this if I wasn't called of God. Because it's challenges. Let's get ready to, to look at chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. We're going to be in verse 17. Chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, chapter of verse 17. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for what you have in store for us. We thank you that your word tells us exactly what we are to expect from pastors. And as pastors, it tells us exactly what we are expected from you or what we are to do. We thank you for loving us, believing in us, and trusting in us. We pray that you'll help us to block out instructions now, any distractions, and then we'll focus on your word and allow your word to come to life before our mind's eye that we can understand, and then we take what we learn and apply it to our life 
to be doers of your word, not hearers only. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Look with me. Verse 17, chapter 5, verse Timothy. Let the elders who rule well. Now that's the pastors that rule well. Remember the primary fu- fu- uh, function of the pastor was to be the spiritual leader of the group, of the congregation, of the house church. It says, let the elders who rule well be counted what? Worthy. 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 Let them be counted worthy. I'll tell you, those pastors that commit suicide, the number one reason is they felt unworthy. They felt unloved, unappreciated by not only their congregation, but also their family. See, it's kind of crazy. You're trying to please everybody. And a, a, a pastor is not a place for a people pleaser. It'll become a nightmare in a lot of churches. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of a what? Not just an honor, but a what? A double honor. Now that word honor, that that word there in the Greek, it's talking about respect. It's actually an ancient writing uh, in the Bible that refers to financial payment when you look at other places for services rendered. It is an honor to be called of God to the ministry. An honor. You get that? It's an honor to be called into ministry. You know why it's an honor? Because God says... I've equipped you to handle the challenges of ministry. And when you're called of God into the ministry, whatever ministry it is, then God's equipped you to do the work of ministry. Therefore, you'll be in perfect peace with God. No matter how crazy things get, no matter how busy things get, when you're called of God, you're not going to burn out if you keep your priorities in check. And let me tell you something, folks. A lot of pastors don't keep their priorities in the right order. We get them mixed up because deep down we want to please people. And when we want to please people, it will always lead to a downfall, a negative response. So, John, don't ever think you need to please the congregation. That is not your job. That is not what you're called to do. We're going to talk more about that, too. It says that it, 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 an honor, not just an honor now, this is a double honor. What does it mean for a double honor? Well, first, it's an honor to be called of God. Second, it is an honor to be called of a church to a position that is sponsored by payment, by receiving gifts. A double honor being called to a position of a spiritual leader with adequate pay. Y'all heard that word, right? Adequate pay. Let me tell you, I can talk all day on this. There are so many churches out there that enter in spiritual abuse trying to keep the pastor paid so little that he can't even provide for his own family. In a lot of churches, a lot, and they call it full time. <laughs> and it shouldn't be full time, it should be bi vocational because there's no way that the amount of money they're willing to pay pays what the pastor needs. It's sad. Uh, there's a phrase within pastor circles that I hear often. I've never said it until today. I've only heard it said, you know, it's, it's sort of like this agreement between the church and God saying, Lord, you keep the pastor humble and we'll keep him poor, you know, humble and poor, poor and humble. It's like the pastor doesn't need to take his family on a vacation. It's like the pastor don't need to give an escape. The pastor don't need to do these things that everybody else wants to do. And it's disheartening. Some of it is because they don't understand the, the, the financial structure. When Pastor John interviews at churches, they'll offer him a package. That package means like, hey, let's say seventy thousand dollars. Well, if you got to pay both sides of taxes, you got to pay both sides of Social Security. Well, really, if you were working at Walmart, you'd be getting fifty thousand dollars. You wouldn't be getting sixty-five or seventy. It, it, it really, but then you got to take out other stuff because you're self-employed, and, it, and it's crazy because you can't grasp it. So our numbers as a self-employed person do not match numbers of an employed person because there's other things we have to do behind the scene that takes away from our life. Oh, but you get a. You get a tax break, John. You don't have to pay taxes on your housing income. Wow. That is a break. That's slowly going away in Pennsylvania, too. They're trying to take that away, too. It's not much, but it's a little bit. And every little bit helps. Here, the scripture says, let the elder who rule well, the pastor who leads well, be counted worthy of a double portion, especially those who labor, that means to work hard, in both the what? The word and what else? Those are two words. One means preaching and one means teaching. And that's exactly what most pastors do. They preach and they teach. There is a difference between teaching and preaching. You don't believe me? Go back a few months ago when I was just doing teaching. Because I did teaching from COVID all the way until a few months ago when we started First Timothy. And then I decided I'm tired of teaching. Teaching is a lot more work. I like preaching. That way I just study and say, okay, Lord, tell me what you want to say. 
And he tells me, and I say it, and it's all so much easier, so much nicer. <laughs> but some people like teaching, and you, you get a little bit more in-depth. You, you, you know, we put them blanks on the handout so you can fill in the blanks and all that stuff. Look at verse 18. For the scripture says, you shall not do what? Muzzle, Muzzle an ox while it is treading out grain. This is coming from Deuteronomy. It says, when an animal works and is being used to separate grain, do not keep it from eating grain. And you know why you don't want to keep the animal from eating grain? Because he's pulling a load. He needs the energy he gets from the food source so that he can continue working hard. You know, uh, I asked for prayer Wednesday night because last Thursday I entered uh, this bicycle contest and this stationary bicycle. I burned up 6,000 calories. I only ate 3,000. You know what happens when you're eating a lot less than you're taking in? You get tired. You get weak. You cannot muzzle up the ox to where he cannot eat because he needs the food in order to pull the load, in order to do the work. That's exactly what it's saying here about pastors. Don't muzzle them up where they can't do their job so that they can't eat. Look, look on. It says, for scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the labor is what? Worthy of his wages. This is coming from Luke chapter 10 verse 7 when Jesus said a worker should be given his pay. Those who work deserve their pay. That's Jesus' word. So here we got Paul quoting the Old Testament and the New Testament talking about Jesus giving a proof text for the principle of providing adequate financial care for pastors. I don't know if you're aware because I am on staff as a full-time pastor. I don't know if you're aware that there are some churches that believe that every pastor of every church should be volunteer. They should volunteer. They should not be paid. A matter of fact, the Mormon church, their whole basis is on that. Every bishop is a volunteer. They have to be successful in the business world to be able to be elevated to that position. Don't get me started. God said in the Old Testament, Jesus said in the New Testament, that a worker is worthy of their pay. You go to work and work 40 hours, you won't be paid for that 40 hours, right? If you went to payday and then the, the, your boss said, well, you work for two weeks, but we only going to pay you one week this week, this month, or this two weeks, right? You wouldn't be very excited. And if they did that over and over, would you keep working there? No, because see, your time is valuable to you. Guess what? Time to a pastor is valuable. I am blessed beyond measure for you. Because when I go on vacation, our deacons step up. Our assistant pastor steps up. And I don't get bothered. I can actually focus on our uh, time away. And when we come back, we're energized and excited and grateful. Because you are awesome. What do you pay me for? Oh, that's what I'm getting to right there. That's my favorite part. You do not pay me as an employee. I am not your employee. The church is not my boss. You don't tell me what to do. You need to know that, John. You need to know that. When you go somewhere, you need to tell them that. I told them, this, this church, that when I first came here, they understood the principles of what I was talking about. I didn't say it as bluntly as that. I am a servant of God. I am called of God. I am following God's leadership. He's my boss. He's the only one I listen to. And sometimes that makes churches upset. They're like, hey, Pastor, we need to have a talk. We didn't like how you did. Uh, don't talk to me. Take it to the complaint department. That's God. I'm just following what he said do. Now, there, there's policy that you do. There's a, a nice way of doing things. There's a rude way of doing things. And sometimes I don't know which side I err on. But, you know, you never know. It depends how what's going on. <laughs> I'm a servant, first and foremost, of God. The church supports me financially. You know why? To free me up so I can do what I'm called to do. Now, we saw earlier in 1 Timothy what a pastor's responsibility is, right? It is two things is all the pastor's responsibility is for the church. Two. That's it. Now, if you go on and you look at job listing, John, they got all kinds of stuff listed on there. I think got some crazy. Some of them got so many things that if you were five people, you couldn't do them all in 40 hours. It's insane. It's like, they got to be kidding. Oh, and by the way, we're going to pay you $25,000 so you can say four. <laughs> Not going to happen. You pay me to free me up to do the job that God's called me to do. Number one is to pray. God holds me accountable for my prayers for each one of you. He holds me accountable for my prayers for our staff. He holds me accountable for my prayers for this community. He holds me accountable for everything we do as an outreach. He holds me accountable for every mission trip we go on. He holds me accountable to be praying for all of these things that we do to get the gospel out to the world and to grow up spiritually mature people. He holds me accountable for those prayers. I take it very serious. 
I block off time where I will not allow anybody to disturb me so that I can be talking with God and listening to God one on one, me and him. And that's it. The second thing that he calls us to do is to preach his word, to teach his word, to be in prayer so that we can preach his word accurately. I heard one church that was looking for a pastor said, we want you to do all of these things in your study time to preach. That's on your own time. Because God's called you to do that. We're not, we're not going to pay you to do that. We don't want you to take office time to do that. Oh, that's kind of insane, isn't it? I can tell you, there are some crazy thoughts out there. You pull a church with a thousand people, what the pastor's responsibility is, they come up with so many things. Some of you are like, what is that? What does that mean? I don't understand that. None of it in Scripture. In Scripture, the Bible says that we are held accountable by God to pray and to teach. So why are we paid? So we can be available to pray with you before your surgery. So we can be available to listen to you when you're going through a difficult time. Why do you pay us? So we can give advice and direction if you want it. That's why you pay us is to make us available to assist, to help. And let me tell you, most emergencies don't happen between 9 and 5. Many a time at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting beside somebody's bedside at the hospital. Oftentimes, I'm counseling between husband and wife who couldn't go to sleep at 3 o'clock in the morning. They decide to call the pastor before they kill each other. You know, it, it's never a convenient time, or oftentimes it's not a convenient time. It's not a nine to five. And now what I do, if I'm out all night long doing ministry, I take time off the next day or two. I, I'm going to get my time back because, see, i got to take care of myself. You ain't going to take care of me. i got to take care of me. And it's us having boundaries in our ministry, in our life, that we don't rob from our family to give to our church family. We have to be careful because the priorities of, of, of the pastor is number one, our relationship with God. Number one. That's our relationship with God. Nothing can come before that or we will set ourselves up for failure. Number two is our family. Our family. Not you. Not the church. Church is not before the family. Because see, the church can fire us or let us go or encourage us to go another direction. Not our family. That's until death do us part. It's a real marriage. Then you've got the ministry to the church. Now, if I was bivocational, my, my, my job would come before the ministry of the church because i got to pay the bills, i got to put food on the table. Then the ministry of the church. So we have to have those priorities. And sometimes I, 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 it, it hurts people's feelings. Well, I, I can't come up there for that surgery because it's an hour and a half away and I don't have that much time to go to give. And it's heartbreaking. You know me. Personally, I very seldom ever do that. Because that's part of my main ministry. I love being up there when you're having a surgery, when you have not. And when COVID hit, it changed the opportunity to go and do that. Don't get to sit with families during the surgery time and get to know them better, to encourage them, to share Jesus with them, to be Jesus to them. We don't get to do that. And then they bounce back and forth. Oh, yeah, you can come in and pray with them before surgery. No, you can't. Last night you could, not today. It, it changes. We never know. So thankfully we have telephones and we have FaceTime, video chat. We can talk and we can pray wherever we at. So praise the Lord for that. And that's the other reason why I don't like to go out of town. It seems like every time I go out of town, something happens bad. Ain't that right? John knows that they have to step up several times and do things. Funerals, yeah, yeah, step up. Every time I go out of town, it's, I, that's why I try not to tell y'all when I'm going out of town. So subconsciously, you don't have to allow something to happen to you, you know? You're like, you come Sunday, John's preaching, like, where's the pastor? Oh, well, he's on vacation. Oh, I didn't know that. That's right, you're here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Jesus talked about a hireling. You see, a hireling is a person who's paid to watch the sheep. <laughs> A person who's paid to watch the sheep do not care for those sheep. They only care about that pay. So what does the hireling do when the wolf comes? He runs away, preserve himself, and lets the, sh the, the wolf destroy the sheep. Those called of God, called to love people, they don't run away. They stand firm and fight. They protect as well as provide. See, I take that very seriously because, see, when I first went into ministry, I thought my ministry was evangelism. And I didn't want to be a pastor. I wanted to go into places, share Jesus, get people saved, and move to the next location. And, and, and God broke my heart. He says, no, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to be a pastor of the people. See, what a pastor of the people has to do is fall in love with the people. And when you pray for the people, and when I pray for you by name, and I pray for you for every situation. You cannot help but to love you more and more and more. The pastor 
loves the sheep and is willing to give his life for the sheep. The hireling is going to run. So I'm not a hireling. You don't pay me. I'm not your employee. You pay me so I can be available to you to do what God's called me to do. I'm going to preach regardless. I'm going to teach regardless because that's what he's called me to do. I am his servant. The good shepherd is what Jesus was referred to. I, Pastor John, we are under shepherds. We are shepherds in training following after the model of the good shepherd. We follow after. We desire to be just like the good shepherd. Look at verse 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from what? Another translation says, don't listen to someone who accuses the pastor. You should listen to them only if there are two or three others who say the elder did something wrong. See, words are easy to come by. If you got my book and read it, you'd realize that I talk about the power in words spoken. Once you speak them, you can't take them back. And I guarantee you, most of you, because you are mature, you would own up to the fact that you probably said something that's hurt somebody's feelings that you really wish you would not have said. But it said, it's done, all you can do is apologize, but it is there. The words are out there. Words hurt, and they have lasting effects. Words are easy to come by. It is a, a person who brings an accusation against a pastor or a leader of a church can destroy them as a minister, can destroy the ministry, and can destroy the congregation. And guess what? If you don't take out a serpent, you got to whack off its head, right? Because you know, it's, uh, uh, oftentimes a snake, you hit the tail end, it's still going to grow back, keep going. <laughs> it's still going to be deadly. That's exactly what Jesus, uh, Satan tries to do to the church. If he can take out the pastor, if he can take out the head, then he can destroy the church. So we have to be really on guard because the enemy comes all the time in all different ways. In order for a truth to be established in the court of law, you have to have two or three witnesses. And so Paul is telling Timothy to make sure all of his pastors understand, that his congregation understand, that his deacon leadership understand, that you do not take the word of one person. There has to be proof. And proof needs to be in the voice of two or three who witnesses the inappropriate behaviors of a pastor. And then it is to be brought to light. Now, let me tell you, God does not hold back any punches when it comes to the pastor. And I don't blame him. I get so disheartened with pastors that do so many ridiculous, stupid things. I mean, they do some really bad things. And guess what? Oftentimes, it comes it makes it into the paper. So that all the lost people can see how ridiculous the pastor was. Now, I'll tell you, we are just flesh. We, we are just blood. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to do some things we shouldn't do. We, we are. But God holds us to a very high accountability. We need to make sure that we're prayed up and ask forgiveness for those things that we do. <laughs> um, the New Testament, uh, as well as the Old Testament, in Psalms 105, God says through the, uh, the psalmist... He says, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. Now, I want to be very clear. This does not mean that the church is to cover up things that the pastor's done is inappropriate. Now, those of you who are Southern Baptists, you know there's been some cover-ups going on. It breaks my heart. It makes me sick to my stomach. Anything brought up that has any kind of nature like that, it does not need to be hidden. It does not need to be covered. I don't care how great of a person they are. I don't care how great of a preacher they are. I don't care how great of a pastor they are. If they get into any realm of any kind of abuse, especially on a minor, they need to have themselves put in jail. They need to own up to it and take the responsibility. And God's on the side of that. Look at verse 20. Those elders or pastors who are sinning. Now, this is a reference to a pastor who has failed in leadership, whether it's in the local church, the, in their social life, or their home life. One of only position in leadership left today for to be unapproachable, um, I mean unreproachable, is the pastor. Any other job you can have, any other leadership you can be in, even the president of the United States, you're not held to the highest accountability that the pastor held to. The pastor can't do a lot of things. That others can do and it's okay. Oh, it's just a guy. Oh, it's just a president. Oh, it doesn't matter. Just a pastor. Just a man. Oh, no, it matters. We are still held in. Uh, uh, we can be disqualified from ministry. Look what it says. Those, in verse 20, those elders uh, who are sinning rebuke 
Now this command means in the Greek to bring to light, to expose. Rebuke in the presence of who? All. That means in front of the whole entire church. If they're a denominational leader, in front of the whole entire denomination. They are to be, it is to be presented uh, for all. That the rest may also fear. What is this talking about? It's talking about God's discipline. You know, I grew up with my dad. He had some rules. We break them rules, we get disciplined. You grow up with God, you break the rules, you're going to be disciplined. You don't want him to discipline you. You want to understand, oh, I messed up. Ask forgiveness to be restored because his discipline will be tough. God takes sin as a very serious matter. Very serious matter. And leadership, God doesn't let you cover it up. He says bring it to the whole entire church. The whole entire denomination. Everybody needs to know your dirty laundry is going to be aired. Now there's two reasons for that. One, because God wants the person, the pastor, the leader to understand who he is, that he's made a mistake. Ask forgiveness of God first and foremost. Be restored in his relationship with God first and foremost. Remember, even the book of Revelation when it's talking to the, the seven churches, six of those God gave him the opportunity to repent. That was his main goal. Repent. His response to us as individuals are repent, repent. When you make a mistake, when you sin, repent. Pastors, leaders, when you mess up, repent. So that you can be restored into a right relationship with God first and foremost. But it doesn't stop there. Um, If leaders are allowed to sin without correction, then church members can sin without correction. We've already seen church discipline. That is our responsibility. You know, you hear that phrase all the time. Don't judge me. Well, the Bible tells me to judge you if you're a brother or sister in Christ. I have every right to inspect your fruit. I have every right to come to you and say, brother, you are sinning against God. You are misrepresenting Christ. You are doing damage to the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. It's a big deal. Oh, but People get upset when you come and talk to them. They get upset. Don't you be judging me. Don't you be telling me. Well, I'm just trying to help you understand that God's going to get you. God's going to hold you accountable. God's going to discipline you. You need to understand. Sin is sin. Ask forgiveness. Move away from it and don't get back into it. Look what else he says in verse 21. God speaking through Paul to Timothy and to all the pastors in the church of the area. He says, I charge you, Timothy, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elected, that's the chosen or the highest angels, that you observe these things. That means obey these instructions without prejudice. That means don't take sides. Without prejudice, don't take sides. Doing nothing with partiality. In other words, treat every person The same. Do not show favoritism to any person. Now, I'll tell you, as a pastor, sometimes I get people come up to me and say, well, we know you got your favorites in the church. They they, they come up to you, John. They'll tell you that stuff. I'm like, what what are you talking about? Oh, yeah, I heard you hang out here. You hang out there. You do this with them. Um, Because I was invited. And as their pastor, I showed up. You're jealous because I spent time with them. You haven't invited me to anything. You've not taken me out to eat. You've not invited me to your house. You've not done anything. Don't get upset with me. You know, you'll get this. You know, say, oh, no, no, no. They invited me. You know, and when you're invited, it's rude to say no, isn't it? You can only say no a few times and you'll be like, oh, oh, you don't like me. No, you go, you accept, you hang out with them. You, you spend time with them. Gives you an opportunity to know how to pray for them better. You don't want others to be jealous. And you don't need favorites. Don't ever have favorites, John. Maybe nobody in church can be your best friend. Because if you tell them that they got to do something, they get upset. I'm your friend. <laughs> I'm your spiritual leader. You got to lead. And it's hard. That's one of the burnout reasons is pastors don't have friends they get to hang out with. Now, Pastor John has had me as an example. And you got to go make friends in other avenues. You create your, you know, I didn't, I never played pickleball. I didn't know what pickleball was. Decided, hey, let's go play pickleball. Meet some people. Share Jesus with them. Most of the pickleball players were Christians that I encountered, so didn't have any of them come into church. Ride motorcycles, let's go do ride motorcycles, you know, get involved with these old people riding motorcycles when I was young, and they, now, now they about, I'm about the age that they were when I started riding. Share Jesus with them, love on them, most of them have been believers. 
We had a few of them come and be members for a while. Uh, we got Brother Keith back in the back, part of the Blue Knight. Part of the police department. Why do I uh, be a chaplain with the police department? Voluntarily, not paid. Spend hours going out and hanging out with people that are in a bad situation, in a crisis. To meet people to share Jesus with. Amen. Dirt bike riding. To develop great relationships. Best friends. People to hang out with outside of church. I hear pastors tell me all the time, I can't, I can't find any lost people. You know, I go to church, my office, everybody's saved. I go to church and I preach, everybody's saved. I, I do, everybody's saved. I'm like, you need to get out your little bubble then. You need to find something. Be intentional. Oh, well, I can't. Church expects me to be in the office 60 hours a week. <laughs> well, you need to talk to your church. They need to understand. You've got to take care of yourself. Or you burn out and you just become a statistic. You just become a statistic. How heartbreaking that is be. Because let me tell you. There was a period of time that I was not preaching. I was called of God. I was equipped of God. I was called to preach. And I, I went from North Carolina, pastoring a church, to Pensacola, Florida. Couldn't get a church to even entertain. Couldn't even, they wouldn't even let me fill the pulpit. I mean, it was just crazy. So my buddy called me up and said, hey, I'm going to pay you this amount of money. I said, how much? I ain't never made that much money in my life. Okay, I'll work for you. I didn't realize that job was going to entail, you know, I get two hours sleep here, two hours sleep there. And you, you, you only get two or three hours sleep a night for six months. You get wore down pretty quick. You get on edge. You get a little aggravated. People get on your nerves. You don't want to be around them. You'd rather punch them in the face, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> kind of rude. But that's what happens when you lack that sleep. And, and, and the job paid well, but I was managing people that weren't doing their job. And that's the whole place hard. And to fire one guy. Uh, it was tough. The guy worked there for several years. Wasn't doing his job. but picking a paycheck up. So we fired him. He didn't like that. And you know what happened? Not even 30 minutes later, a man came off the street, knocked on the door and said, I want to apply for this position of being a mechanic. I said, what are you talking about? We ain't even advertised it. Well, I worked with Brother John down there in Tallahassee. And I, I want to work for him now. And he's in Pensacola. I want to work for him. I said, all right, did you know 30 minutes ago I just fired one of our mechanics so we have an opening right now. When can you start? He said, right now. My tools are in my truck. I said, let's go. Amen. God provide. He was a Christian. We had Bible study every single morning before he went out to work. The other guys that weren't saved, why y'all going in there reading the Bible? Because there's power in God's Word. There's power when God's people pray. And this guy would go to the job site and something takes four hours. God would bless him to get it done in two hours. The truck driver, it was, it was working on tractor trailers that broke down while they were hauling stuff, you know. The truck driver liked it. The business liked it. And he liked it because he got paid for four hours even though he got it done in two. <laughs> See, God blessed him every single day that we had time together with God before he went out to work. God wants to bless us. He, he blesses the, your pastor. Now you, at Chamberman, I have been blessed by you just as much as I was blessed by the church in Myrtle Grove, uh, just as much as I was blessed by the church in North Carolina. I have been blessed tremendously. You know why? Because you love your pastor. And I know that. And I love you. That's why God does great things through us. You're praying, I'm praying, and he's doing great things. We don't get the credit, he gets the credit. Look what it says in, in the last part of that. And remember we talked about correction in love, restoration to fellowship for a pastor, but not restoration to leadership. I want to understand, you don't understand that a, a pastor disqualifies himself from being a pastor. He don't get to jump right back into leadership. I don't care what you saw with other pastors in TV ministry. That's not the way it should really work. But that's the way they were. Look what he says. The last little part of verse 22. God speaking to Paul to Timothy saying, keep yourself what? Yeah, look, we'll find it. Verse 22. Keep yourself what? Pure. Four letter word. Pure. What he's saying is, Timothy, if a other pastor in your church that you are overseeing, if they mess up, two and three witnesses come forward. You hold them accountable in such a way that they want to be restored to the restored to the relation with God, but don't be too fast. Don't put them back in the pulpit. Don't let them be the leader. They've got time. They got to prove something to you that they have repented, which means turn away from. Them. Look at verse twenty three. No longer drink only water, but use a little what? I know people quote this all the time. Use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. That means to keep you from being sick often. Apparently, Timothy got sick quite a bit. Now, let me tell you something about the water over there in Israel. 
is tainted with bacteria. We know that now, that we didn't know that back then. And a matter of fact, even years ago, when you were going on a mission trip, you know the number one thing they tell you not to ever, 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 ever do, not even in case of emergency, not even when brushing your teeth. Do not what? Drink the water. Even the people that live there drink the water and get sick. Don't drink the water. You're going to be sick. Now, if you want to be sick, just drink some of the water. It's got filled with bacteria. And the other thing when you go on a mission trip in this modern day is they give you these uh, little yogurt things that have probiotics. They say, every day you've got to have this or you've got to be good bacteria in your system fighting the bad, the bad bacteria. God knew that the water was tainted. He gave them a way to ferment water, turn it into wine, so that it would not hurt your stuff. Now here, Paul is telling Timothy, He's not endorsing alcoholism. He is not endorsing drinking alcohol every single day. Look what he says. He says, no longer drink only water, but use a what? There's the key word. A little, a little wine for your stomach. Now, what we know is that if he takes a little bit of wine here and there, it's going to help correct that bacterial stuff in his system, and he won't be as sick as all. Look at verse 24. Some men's sins are what? <laughs> they are clearly evident. I preached in the church. They met me after the service and said, don't come back tonight. Give me a check. I said, what? I'm supposed to come back tonight. What, what, what's going on? No explanation. I said, oh, okay. It was a youth-led service. I brought a bunch of teenagers out there. We did a service. Then we went to the park. Back in, and we was in Georgia. We went to a park where we're going to do public ministry and all this stuff. And one of the guy that called me to be the speaker for youth led service on Sunday to be an encouragement to this church came out to the park and watched us do the public ministry and ministering to the people in the community and, and then he pulled me aside and he said you know why they didn't want you to come back tonight I said no nah. he said well you talk about teenagers avoiding drugs you talk about teenagers avoiding alcohol one of our deacons owns a bar he didn't like that so he don't want you coming back I said you allow a person who owns a bar to be a deacon leader in your church and you give him power? Well, he contributes quite a bit of money to the church. Oh! I said, I am glad. I wish you'd have told me that earlier. I knocked all my dust off of me and all my teenagers' feet before we left there. I think we're going to go knock our dust off now. Uh, that's a church seeing sin and endorsing it by allowing it to be a leader in the church. That is unacceptable. Unacceptable. Any leader of church it should be transparent and they should not have indulgence of stuff that we consider to be sin. And let me tell you, get mad at me. Owning a bar is sin. You are encouraging people to become alcoholics and it, to me it's unacceptable. But hey, that's just me, personally. I've been in a lot of bars. I've seen the way people have, behave. I've seen the attitudes and the actions. Yeah. Bad stuff go on. So that's something that you can see evident. And it says that some men's sins are clearly, it's obvious, easy to see, an ungodly business, a publicly uh, doing ungodly things in such a way that it is recognized, developing a reputation to be an ungodly person based on the things you do, as well as the words you say. Words are powerful. Words reveal a lot. A negative attitude, always being negative, 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 and then throwing some colorful language for no reason at all. I can understand somebody getting mad and saying some curse words, but in just normal conversation, having to throw in a bunch of... No, no, that's clearly evident of somebody who the Spirit of God ain't convicting. So maybe they don't have the Spirit of God living inside of them. Oh, mercy, meddling, meddling, meddling. Look what else it says. Some men's sins are clearly evident preceding them to judgment. In other words, we know they're going to be judged for those sins. No problem with that. But those sins of some men follow when? Oh, these are the sins that are not seen until later. These are the folks that are good at hiding their sins. They're sneaky. They're deceptive. They think they're getting away with it. But nothing is hidden from God and Jesus will reveal all at judgment time. Look at verse 25. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, seen easily. And those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Um, the good deeds done in secret will someday come to light. They will not stay hidden forever. That's why God says, when you're praying, go into your closet where nobody sees you. It's not a public display like the religious people go into street corners and raise their hand and make a big show of it. Go into your closet and pray. Because the Father sees you in secret. He'll reward you openly. 
Those prayers are going to be answered in a positive, powerful way because of your commitment to being faithful. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean you pray for somebody's healing, everybody's going to be healed. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that. It's a practice for us, talking to the Father, giving us something to bring to Him, interceding on behalf of others, so that if God chooses to do a miracle, you don't stand up in front of people and say, oh, I pray God would do that. Because then you have your reward to pass on the back. But privately you smile and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that. Praise you. You get the glory for it. And then one day when you stand in a judgment, all of those things you did in private that nobody knows about, the person down on the road that you helped financially and you didn't tell nobody, the person that, you, that was in need of prayer and you prayed and God blessed, you will be openly rewarded for all to see. And what a glorious time that will be when we stand before Christ Betroth to Him. And the Father gives us award, rewards for what we did to honor Him. What a blessing it's going to be as those crowns, those jewels start piling up. I don't know about you, but I want them to be piled up so high that it takes me and a few of the angels to move the stuff to Jesus when we give it to Him. Because that's why we do it. The things we do is to honor and glorify Him. Once we get in a relationship with Him, it's sort of like a husband and wife. You know, most of y'all know Adam uh, and Sabrina got married and, and, and they want to do stuff for each other. And, and I'm sure you, you got that significant other, you know, we want to do stuff for you, want to do stuff for you, want to be a blessing, a blessing, a blessing. It should not ever stop. You should always want that. That's the way the church is to Jesus. That's the way Jesus is to the church. And isn't it amazing that as Timothy closes out this chapter, I mean, as, as Paul closes out this chapter to Timothy, that he talks about, how to correct older men and younger men, older women, younger men, the women, how to take care of those who are really widows and those who are not really widows, and how to take care of your pastor. And then he says, hey, you're not going to get away with anything either. Sins of the pastor should be revealed, but so will the person who thinks they've got it all hidden. But you who do things in private and, and, and secret, he says he's going to openly reward you. Because of your faithfulness and your commitment to Him. If you bow your head, close your eyes. What's newsworthy in your life? What's newsworthy in your life? What would be on the front page of the paper if somebody were to interview you and the things you've done throughout your whole entire life? What would be the, the cover page? If you're born again, blood, washed, spirit, baptized, and you love Jesus, there is nothing greater than having that front page the people you have personally influenced to give their heart to Jesus. Whether it's inviting them to church, whether it's sharing the gospel with them, planting the seed, watering the seed, whatever it is, bring it on to church with you. God is going to bless you for that. Those things you do in secret, those prayers you lift up, the people you help, the blessing you are behind the scenes to your church, the tithes you give, the above your tithes that you give to support the ministries of this church, God is going to continue to bless you. The love you give from your personal background of who you are to those you encounter each week, those you encounter throughout the week, those you share a kind word with, those you encourage, God's going to reward you for that. If you're here today and you've never invited Jesus in your heart, you're tuning in, you've never given your heart over to Jesus. He loves you so much that He did what no one else could do. He laid His life down to pay the payment for the sin that is in your life. And all you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Come into my life. Lead my life. Let me follow after you. Let me be your child. Adopt it into your family. That they all pass away and all become new. That's what I want today. We're not promised tomorrow. I only give it today. If you invite Him to your heart, the Bible says you become a new creation. You start a new journey. You want assistance in that? You can come forward in a moment. We'll have a hymn of invitation. We invite you to come forward. Take me by the hand. Let me pray with you. Pastor John's up here. Uh, he can pray with you. We want God to do great mighty things through you. Because as you're blessed, we're blessed by seeing that. As you grow, we're blessed by knowing that you're growing. We are grateful to what God is doing in and through our local fellowship here at Chambersburg Baptist Church. Father, I just pray you continue to speak to us, challenge us, convict us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Standing as